Welcome to the fourth video in our iNav flight series. Now, in the first video, we talked about what iNav was, why it was different from things like clean flight and beta flight. In the second video, we spent a bit of time talking about how to connect an external GPS and also ideally an external compass to give you the best chance of iNav GPS flight modes working flawlessly. And then in the last video, we went through all of the extra little settings that you need to set up in the graphical user interface in order to get this little guy ready to fly. We've been flying iNav on multirotors for a couple of weeks now and had a really good experience. The GPS hold with the nav altitude hold and also the GPS return to home are working brilliantly. And here in the videos, we gave a sneak preview in the last video of the setups and pieces that we did. Here are those modes working with both hold and the return to home acting exactly as you'd expect them to. And speaking to the developers of iNav Flight, that's really what they've been working towards, is something that just works. So it's worthwhile us talking about the common gotchas, reasons that potentially would stop your model from working well like this, and also to go through all of the steps that we would recommend in order to get this thing flying properly. Because with all GPS flight modes, one of the worst things you can do is as soon as you finish setting it up on the bench and you think it's okay, get outside, give it a go and have the GPS mode do something unexpected and either crash your plane or potentially fly away and you never ever see the thing again. So let's start with the most common mistakes and recap on those because we've talked a little bit and we've covered these but it's worthwhile reminding ourselves about them before we go through what you need to do to get this thing flying well. This list has actually come from the iNav development team themselves. So I need to say a very big thank you to Constantine and the team for supporting this series and getting involved and kind of helping us when we were getting a little bit stuck and helping us explain some of the more complicated topics. The first thing that tends to undermine iNav working well is the calibration of the magnetometer isn't very good or the magnetometer is getting interference. As we talked about, we're actually using an external magnetometer up on the GPS itself. We had to change the orientation of that in the GUI, as we talked about in the last video. But once we did that, it worked fantastically well. If you have your flight controller too close to the power electronics, then you may have a situation where the magnetometer is being deflected away from two north, and that will result in some odd behavior. So do those tests and make sure that everything is set up and it's all behaving perfectly in the GUI as well. Do protect the barometer from light, heat and straight changes in pressure. The barometer is primarily what's used for the altitude hold and if there is any weirdness going on with the barometer that will result in the craft drifting up and down quite significantly. Now as you saw in the videos that we're doing here, ours is pretty good and what we did was put a little bit of open cell foam over the thing before we buttoned everything up on the craft. And that's always worth doing and potentially having a look at things like black box recordings after the first couple of flights to make sure that the barometer isn't moving around too much and isn't drifting off. Do make sure that you set up fail safe. We've talked about that in the last video and we're going to talk a little bit more about it in a second. You really want the first time that fail safe is tested to be part of a test where you're ready to dive in and rescue everything if it all goes a little wrong. The first time fail safe kicks in shouldn't be when you've had a disaster and that's when you find out that the setup isn't perfect. And the last thing, which is what we're going to talk about next, is don't try the GPS features first. There is kind of a standard little way of setting these things up to make sure that you're testing every flight mode and building on each proven flight mode to get to the point where you can run the GPS flight modes with confidence. So let's talk about that next. The first thing to do, just like any model we've ever made on the channel, is go out to the field and try a test hover. I tend to try test hovers in either angle or horizon mode, blip the throttle, make sure it rises evenly, and that everything is working fine. If there is any drift at all, then trim that out, either using the board alignment tools in the GUI or the stick combinations that you'll find in the iNav manual. I found that with the couple that we've set up here, once the six axis calibration for the accelerometer was done, it was pretty spot on to be fair. While you're flying around, the other thing you can do in this first test is also just make a note of the throttle position for hover. Now that throttle position is handy because we're going to use it in the next step. 
once the first test is finished, we know that the basic flight controls, the basic accelerometers and gyros and everything are working fine. We have the motors configured and set up the right way. The ESCs are calibrated. The props are on the right way around and the model is good to move on to the next step. Make a note of that throttle value. Connect the machine up to the GUI and then move the throttle on the radio up to that position that you noted was the hover point for your model. Have a look in the receiver tab and see what that value is. Then go into the GUI and change the nav underscore MC underscore hover underscore throttle level to match that level. On ours, this little 200 class quad is not particularly powerful, so we found that that throttle level was about 1600, so just above half throttle for it to sit nicely in the sky. The other way you can set that up is just flick into nav alt hold mode and see whether the model sinks or rises, and then change the value in the CLI command appropriately, change it by 100 every time until you find that sweet spot. Personally, I find this is a much better way to do it because you get it right first time. Once you go out then and test the nav alt hold by flicking it into that without anything else selected, don't bother with the GPS, if the model will then sit nice and stable at the same height and it will wander three or four feet up and down and that's absolutely standard. But if it's doing only that, then you're in a good position to go to the third test. Now in the third test, we're going to turn on the GPS hold mode with the nav alt hold mode that we've just proved works. Now this should give us a 3D hold in space and that's absolutely what we've got the video of here. So go out, again, make sure you're over a nice grassy area. There's loads of room around you in case you have to bring the craft down in the event of a problem because this will be the first time we're using GPS in anger. The board itself will not arm unless it has a solid GPS lock and that's part of the arming checks that the board do. So you'll find that uh, once the GPS is locked, you'll be able to arm the copter and take off. Personally, I put it just above head height. So if I do have a problem, it's got less to, uh, to fall into the ground and pop it into GPS hold with nav out hold at the same time. And then once you're comfortable, it's okay. Just keep it in that position for a couple of minutes running and make sure that it's fine. You can then test by moving the craft to the left, to the right, forwards and backwards. And if you take your hands off the stick, it should then settle back in that position and be happy as well. Once we've got that done, then now we know the gyros and accelerometers working. We know the barometers are happy. We also now know that the GPS is working as well we can have a go at the GPS return to home. Again, over something nice and soft in case you have a problem and make sure that you are ready to take it out of GPS return to home mode at the first sign of something going wrong. So what I'd recommend is you do is fly the copter again at head height away from you, stop it in the air and then flick the mode switch into return to home. Now what return to home is actually doing is lots of different things. First of all, it will stop if you're if it's moving it will climb to the predetermined altitude and all those altitudes and default settings are in the CLI and then once it reaches that altitude it will turn towards home it will fly back to you with the front of the craft looking towards the home position once it flies over that home position or it gets within that radius that it's got the home location stored it will then rotate back to the orientation it was when it was armed so that should mean that its bum is facing towards you and then it will very slowly and gradually sink down onto the ground and then once it hits the ground it'll stop. Now by default the GPS home mode which is also the one that's initiated in failsafe if it has a GPS lock but the default at the moment in 1.5 is that it doesn't auto disarm on landing. Now that's not something that has been extensively tested, but I'm talking to INAV at the moment because I think having it set in a failsafe condition, auto disarming is actually a really good job because if you've lost connection with the model and you can't disarm the model and it's just sat there with the props running, trying to get in then to pick it up to safely unplug the battery is going to be a little bit hairy. Once you've got all that working and you're happy and 
test the GPS return to home a couple of times, try it from a stationary position, try it also when the copter's flying around. Then the last thing to do is have a go at working with your failsafe. And the way I'd work with your failsafe is, again, as we talked about in the last video, make sure that it either has a no pulses or in the failsafe condition, your receiver goes and activates the failsafe mode. And that should mean that, that if there is a GPS lock, it should look and feel exactly like a GPS return to home. Going through each of those steps means that you're building on a solid foundation and double checking that everything is working. And once you've got half a dozen GPS return to homes under your belt and a half a dozen GPS holds, you can start to get a little bit more confident that this board is gonna work great and iNav is gonna work for you with this model. Last couple of thoughts. We did also change a couple of things when we were playing with this. Uh, we upped the gyro L LPF, which stands for low pass filter to 256 Hertz. The LPF is, um, we've talked about it in multi we actually, and it's just a way to try and avoid some of the noise that you get on smaller craft. You tend to find that for something like a little 200 or 180 class quadcopter, you want it right the way up at 256. And for larger models, you potentially want it at a lower value. You want the gyro LPF as high as possible to give you the maximum sensitivity. And if you're experiencing twitches with the model, it usually means that there's a little bit of vibration going through. So you can reduce gyro LPF to the next level down to see if that helps. Other things we did was check that gyro underscore sync was on and gyro underscore sync underscore denom was eight, which basically is one kilohertz PID rate. And you can check those in the CLI as well. You shouldn't need to change any of the PID settings for navigation. Talking to the development team, it looks like that's pretty solid stuff. Although the standard tuning for a multi-rotor absolutely applies here if you want to sharpen up how the model feels and reacts. Word of warning for those of you that have watched this and are now interested in popping this onto a fixed wing, we will be looking at setting it up in a fixed wing in the next couple of videos on the channel. A lot of the standard defaults in iNav at the moment are set up for multi-rotors. Things like waypoint radiuses and the radius around the point in the sky that the model will handle in GPS hold. At the moment they're set way too small for something like a fixed wing to handle and we'll talk about that when we get to that part of the series. There is also lots of development on the fixed wing pieces in iNav 1.6 and future releases as well. Uh, stuff that you can have a look at if you go into the GitHub site along where we've been looking for the wiki for the manual. There's loads of fantastic information about what the developers are up to. And some of it is absolutely cool stuff for fixed wing. So I am so thrilled that we actually have development here for the non-racing community for multi-rotors and development for the non-multi-rotor part of the radio control community too. And the last point here is for those pilots that do try iNav, that have a great experience, that like what the team are doing. Personally, I try and give Patreon subscriptions and support to any of the open source projects that are working that I get benefit from just helps pay for those people's time and keep those projects alive. For those of you that remember the Open Pilot situation a couple of years ago, Open Pilot was a fantastic project, open source, and it simply ran out of money because everyone was using the technology, but there wasn't enough money coming in to pay for the hosting and the continued development iNav for me is one that we will continue to use here because those GPS modes for me are something that I like having up my sleeve and particularly as we're going to have a go at adding it onto the fixed wing. So I am a Patreon of iNav. If you use it, you like it and you get the benefit, then please think about becoming a Patreon of iNav as well and supporting what these guys are doing. So that's it for that video. We've talked about the common mistakes and we've also talked about the process to go through to get your multi-copter flying well with iNav. In the next videos, we're going to change the subject a little bit. It's still going to be iNav, but we'll start looking at how you put in a fixed wing, what's slightly different and what you need to change in the interface and the setup to get it working well. Thank you for taking the time to watch that video. There are lots of other videos on the channel and they're carefully ordered into playlists. So you may find that there are other videos on this same subject that you can go and watch. So I would recommend going into the playlist area of Painless360 YouTube channel and looking around and seeing what there is. You never know what you might find. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe and happy flying.